When we started this offseason, I was team trade back, and you don't have to draft a quarterback in the first round. But now it's all quarterback and number two or nothing, in my opinion. Why the change? I'll tell you that and more on this mailbag episode of Locked On Commanders. Your daily podcast on the Washington Commanders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into this episode of Locked On Commanders, your daily podcast covering the Washington Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget that you can subscribe for free on YouTube or wherever you're getting this podcast. And you can continue this conversation with me by becoming a Locked On Commanders insider. Just go to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Commanders and sign up today to be an insider. From there, you will get news analysis and one-on-one conversations with me via text message no hashtags no apps no filters none of that stuff just direct communication with me your host of this show david harrison credential member of the media covering the washington commanders for commandercountry.com part of sports illustrated's fan nation i'm here with you every monday through friday along with our everydayers and everydayers you already know but i'm gonna tell you anyway i appreciate you for coming through like you always do today's episode is brought to you by fanduel make every moment more right now new customers you get 150 dollars in bonus bets guaranteed that's 150 bucks win or lose visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started today on today's episode we are going to talk about some day two defensive back possibilities as the washington commanders have an interesting decision to make in the second round of the nfl draft coming up this april we're going to talk about why we are locked on quarterback Jaden daniels and before we or when we while we do that we have to talk about the shift in my own personal opinion now, the Washington Commanders have to go quarterback now because in the beginning of the offseason, you might remember every day, uh, I was all about them taking a left tackle early in the first round, potentially even trading back from the number two overall pick. And we uh, are going to have this conversation sparked by a question from insider Steven, who says, if you had final say on whether or not you would draft a quarterback or left tackle, which would you go and who would it be? Well, again, I would go quarterback. Asked me this two months ago, I would go left tackle. Ask me now, I would go quarterback. Why? Well, because of Marcus Mariota, because of the fact that Marcus Mariota is now your only, or your, I don't say your only, but your number one quarterback in the room. And that is because Sam Howell has been traded. Although I'm not typically a fan of putting a rookie quarterback behind a suspect offensive line. And that's exactly what you're going to be doing in Washington, no matter who you draft at tackle uh, or no matter who you start at tackle. Again, Adam Peters, general manager, swears that he would be perfectly fine with Cornelius Lucas and Andrew Wiley being your starting bookend tackles. Uh, I don't know if I believe him completely. I don't know if I think Dan Quinn is okay with that. But regardless, even if you draft a guy in the first round at left tackle, that tackle is suspect until he's not suspect, right? Everything is projection. Everything is potential until it's not. And right now, uh, so even if you draft a, a Joe Alt or an Olu Fashanu or a Talisi Fuaga or whoever it is, you're going to be drafting potential and potential is suspect, right? So I'm not a fan of putting a rookie quarterback behind a suspect offensive line, but that is what the Washington Commanders uh, need to do in this situation because you can't put Marcus Mariota back there as a starting quarterback and tell the rest of these players and tell the Terry McLaurins of the world, tell the Jonathan Allens of the world who have been dealing with so much quarterback turnover and so much subpar quarterback play and tell them, hey, go out there and give us 110% every single snap, every single play. And yes, Marcus Mariota, who's had opportunities in Tennessee, He's had opportunities with the Raiders, opportunities with the Falcons, uh, and then most like, and then Leap most recently was the true blue, no questions asked backup for the Philadelphia Eagles. You can't put him as your day one starting quarterback and say, we are legitimately going to have an opportunity to be competitive day in and day out. You would have had that opportunity if you were going with a veteran, say like Jacoby Brissett, who did come in in some spots last year and did fairly well. So you got guys like Terry McLaurin on the roster, Jahan Dotson, some of the linemen who can say, look, Jacoby came in, was real comfortable, was really in control, delivered a good ball. We have a chance with him uh, at quarterback. Marcus Mariota, that's a much harder sell. Sam Howell's still in the room. That's an easier sell as well. Hey, we're going to improve our protection around him. Weapons have another year with him. Our offense is going to cater more to what he does versus trying to make him cater to what Eric Bionmi wanted to do. You can sell that. You cannot sell Marcus Mariota. So the question is now, not only that now we're going quarterback, because again, you have to at this stage as far as I'm concerned. So which quarterback? Well, it's going to be Jaden Daniels. Why? Specifically, it's because of Cliff Kingsbury. Now, I will tell you that personally, I do have Jaden Daniels ranked higher on my personal quarterback list than I do Drake May. 
I will actually, to be honest with you, I also have J.J. McCarthy out there, but J.J. is much more of a projection type of situation. I think Drake May is the better quarterback first year, maybe even two in the NFL, while J.J. I think has the higher upside if you have the right people around him, put the right system around him, right? So anyway, it's a different conversation. But Jane Daniels, and the reason it's Jane Daniels for me is because of Cliff Kingsbury. There's no direct connection, right, between Coach Dan Quinn and Cliff Kingsbury. None. Like they never worked with each other with each other. They never worked in the same spot. None of that stuff. Adam Peters, Cliff Kingsbury, same thing. Have no direct correlation. So why did this new regime hire Cliff Kingsbury? Because he was hard to beat while they were in the NFC West. So Dan Quinn went up against Cliff Kingsbury, uh, not necessarily in the NFC West, but when Cliff was in the NFC West, Adam Peters, assistant GM for the 49ers, went up against Cliff Kingsbury in the NFC West with Quarterback Kyler Murray. Let me read you some notes from uh, a, a fairly recent draft profile. Uh, here's some notes here. Never seems to get rattled. Plus runner and passer. True dual threat quarterback. Twitchy ball handler. Effective passer on the move. Uncommon ability to extend plays. Elusive pocket target. Uh, outruns defenders like a running back. Torments opponents with third down conversions using his legs. Who is that sound like? Does it sound like Jane Daniels? What also sounds like Kyler Murray because that those lines specifically are from a Kyler Murray draft profile. That is who Cliff Kingsbury targeted to run his offense in Arizona. That is who he drafted. Those lines sound a heck of a lot like Jane Daniels. They don't sound as much like Drake May or even J.J. McCarthy. So to me, I just I just think, again, the fit is there. Like if you're bringing in a, an offensive coordinator who has a past, but you know him and you know what he's capable of because you've worked with him before, you've had these theological conversations about football, then fine, maybe you go a different direction. But this is a coach that Dan Quinn and Adam Peters have never worked with. They've worked around him. They've worked against him. They know what he's capable of with a quarterback like Kyler Murray. Jaden Daniels fits that profile the best, and he's even taller, uh, which hopefully will make it even better. So, again, the f- that to, to, for all of that, I think it's Jaden Daniels. Another reason, coachability. Jaden Daniels didn't come out of nowhere. A lot of people who, who casually watch college football or don't necessarily follow more than one team I think that Jaden Daniels kind of relatively came out of nowhere. But this story has been developing for five years. He was a freshman at Arizona State in 2019, and he had a 60.7 completion percentage, 8.7 yards per pass attempt, 125 carries for 355 yards. That's 2.8 yards per carry. His last senior year, he had two senior years. His second senior year at LSU in 2023, he had a 72.2% completion rate, 11.7 yards per attempt, 135 rushes for 1,134 yards, 8.4 8.4 yards per carry. He ran the ball 186 times also in 2022. So this running ability, other than 186, that's kind of the anomaly, but 125 carries as a freshman, 135 his final year in college football. It's not that he just suddenly realized how to run, but he he figured out how to run better. The pass completion, 72% his final year, 60% his first year starting in college. It's not that he never had the arm or the ability. It's that he got smarter and got better. Now you could say, Jane Daniels did it all by himself and just took five years to do it. I would tell you that this that's a sign that this kid is coachable. He's developable. I don't know if that's really a word. You can develop him, right? So we have a guy like Cliff, Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury who has a history of taking a young quarterback, trying to develop him. You're not going to have the issues, I think, that you have with Kyler Murray. Because uh, remember, there were questions about Kyler coming out of Oklahoma about his dedication to football and his true dedication to being a student of the game. Jane Daniels does not have those questions, and his history at college shows that he is a student in the game. He is willing to be coached. Also, by the way, had three offensive coordinators during his college career continue to get better despite that fact. And typically, we talk about quarterbacks. We talk about them having multiple offensive coordinators as a negative for Jane Daniels. He has continued to grow even while changing through offensive coordinators. So for me, like I said, I didn't fully come off my team building stance of trade back, grab tackles, build around Sam Howell. And then in two or three, two, two years, really, if you're not getting where you need to with Sam, then you can kind of go all in on that quarterback and you have a better nucleus to put around him. I didn't come off that stance until they traded Sam Howell because you can't build around Sam Howell if Sam Howell is no longer on the roster. If it was Jacoby Brissett here and not Marcus Mariota, I don't know that I would be fully off that tip, but I could say that I could still be on that because when I look at the New England Patriots, I don't think they're a team that have to, have to, have to take a quarterback at number three. And the Sam, uh, so the Sam Howell trade. Oh, by the way, Jaden Daniels, LSU quarterback, visiting the Washington Commanders for his official top 30 visit Monday. That visit will go into Tuesday via Adam Schefter of ESPN, who 
got that information from Jane Daniels agent. So it's, you can take it to the bank. Uh, so the, so the Sam Howell trade, uh, you know, obviously takes my draft methodology uh, to a different direction, but the fact that they traded Sam Howell, is actually another indicator to me that Jaden Daniels is going to be your new quarterback for the Washington Commanders this April. That's coming up next on this mailbag episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And this episode of Locked On Commanders is brought to you by FanDuel. It's playoff time in the NBA and the NHL. Baseball is in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers, you get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed that's 150 bucks whether you win or you lose bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks all on an app that is safe secure and easy to use the boston celtics are currently plus 165 favorites to win the nba finals while the florida panthers are plus 700 favorites to win the stanley cup in the nfl the san francisco 49ers are plus 500 favorites to win super bowl 59 and the georgia bulldogs are plus 300 favorites to win the college football national championship this coming season. What are you waiting for? Visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win. Again, fanduel.com slash locked on and you're guaranteed $150 in bonus bets. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Continuing now with today's episode of Locked On Commanders. Thanks again for making Locked On Commanders your first listen today and every day. Every day, make sure you come back tomorrow. We'll plow more through uh, into the week. We'll talk more about what's going on around the Washington Commanders. In fact, in, in including rather, not in fact, including conversation around a potential wide receiver still on the free agent market that Washington could target after the NFL draft. Are you watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your television all day while you're waiting for your next episode of Locked On Commanders? Are you finding that you have to turn the volume down when all the shouting begins, well, make the switch now to Locked On Sports Today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without all of the screaming. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinion, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team, every day. Our next question in the mailbag comes from Scott, uh, who says, the Sam Howell trade was dumb. Uh, The hit rate on first rounders is super low. And to me, Sam showed enough to be a quality starter or better with a better offensive offensive line. Why waste a fifth round pick that should have been a second plus pick swap with Seattle and Sam's cost is minimal. Why not take swings and double your odds of a home run? So first of all, Scott, love the confidence in the way that you started that question. Uh, But you're right. The hit rate on franchise quarterbacks in the first round in the past 10 drafts, especially has been very, very low from 2023 NFL draft to the 2014 NFL draft. 32 quarterbacks have been drafted in the first round. Three of them have helped lead their teams to conference championships or higher. Those three quarterbacks, Patrick Mahomes, who was the second quarterback taken in his draft, Josh Allen, who was the third quarterback taken in his draft, and Lamar Jackson, who was the fifth quarterback taken in his draft. And those three quarterbacks came from two drafts, which means you have eight drafts worth of first round picks, uh, first round pick quarterbacks that have yet to lead their teams to conference championships or higher. And look, to some of those, like C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young, it's a little bit unfair. They just started. C.J. Stroud certainly looks like a potential quarterback who could be on the way to doing so. In fact, Luke Braun of Locked On Vikings and I talked about that very topic on the Locked On NFL episode for Tuesday. So if you want to catch that conversation, head over to Locked On NFL. Um, But the bottom line is, uh, I, I agree. Like, obviously, the hit rate on quarterbacks in the first round is low. We did an episode every day. As you'll remember, we we did a deep dive into some of the numbers of, like, NFL history, not just the last 10 years uh, of franchise quarterbacks in the first round of the draft. The hit number is low. Now, there are multiple reasons for that. But I also agree here that Sam Howell showed enough that he could be a quality starter or better with better pieces around him. The offensive line was suspect from the beginning of the season, getting him hit, putting him under pressure early and often, and the defense wasn't doing him any favors Either by the time the offensive line started to settle down, by the time the defense started to hold opponents uh, to relatively low scores, Sam Howell was essentially what I call shell-shocked uh, and pretty much was done as far as I was concerned. The Washington Commanders probably should have put Jacoby Brissett in uh, either before or right after Thanksgiving uh, and just told Sam to hang it up and you know, I mean, we'll digest all the lessons and come back next year uh, with your career still intact. But unfortunately, they didn't make that decision. However, even with all of the stuff that happened last year, uh, when the Washington Commanders went out to trade Sam Howell, 
They had at least three teams interested, reportedly four teams interested, but I know of three that have been quote unquote confirmed who wanted to trade for him. Ultimately, the Seattle Seahawks get him. And something that gets brought up here is the draft spot versus projection value, which I think is very interesting. Not something we've really talked about uh, a lot here is that you already got a guy who a lot of people projected as a day two quarterback. And I know for a fact that at least five teams in the in in, in the 2022 NFL draft projected Sam Howell as a day two pick. But all of those teams went out and got veteran quarterbacks or had their quarterback situation shift before the draft enough that they decided not to pull the trigger on drafting a quarterback on day two, which is why he was there on day three to begin with. So you get a day two quarterback for a day three price in 2022. Uh, you know, he's still in his rookie contract. So you go ahead and you you trade him away, but you already kind of got a profit. So whatever profit you get from him is almost kind of squandered because you already got that profit if you really look at it that way. So that was an interesting part of it. So the, but the crux of the question here is why move on, right? Why move Sam out when he's on a rookie deal? Uh, you obviously have a lot of flux on this team, right? Like, look at all the one-year deals they've signed this offseason. So they obviously don't necessarily look at this roster and say, boom, this is our roster, you know, 80% filled, all that stuff. And this is very much a wait-and-see project. So if it's a wait-and-see project for the rest of the roster, why not take a wait-and-see approach at quarterback and say, look, we got a guy. Let's see what he can be with us and then make a decision going there. Um, so the reason why I'll tell you right up front, we'll, we'll dive into to it a little bit more here is they don't want the Sam Howell style of quarterback. That's honestly what my opinion is on why the team moved on from him. They like him. They like his competitiveness. But when they looked at him on tape, they said, that's not the dude. That's not the kind of dude that we want on film. So let's look at, again, some profile comments, right? Multiple years of starting college experience, team captain, tight spiral, good velocity, plus arm talent, fearless, climbs the pocket while continuing to look for targets mobile enough to slide in the pocket and toughness to run for yards uh, has flashed the clutch gene struggles against pressure looks inconsistency and accuracy at times gets uncomfortable when the initial read isn't there interceptions due to poor decisions. That sounds like Sam Howell, right? Well, all of those draft profile comments, Drake may, those are all Drake may bullets, but they also apply to Sam Howell. I'm not saying they're the exact same quarterback. Obviously Drake may is taller than Sam Howell. And certainly you don't want to call somebody a carbon copy, but they're very similar type quarterback. So if so that why that matters is if you're trading Sam Howell away, then it would be feasible that again, that's one of two reasons. And for me, one reason is because you don't think that he fits your style of play, right? We've heard coach Quinn and the assistant coaches, the coordinators talk about this a lot. It's not so much scheme specific as it is style specific. They don't believe Sam Howell fits the style of play that they want to execute here in Washington. Well, again, Drake may fits the profile that Sam Howell fits very, very well. Then you could argue Drake may also not the style of quarterback that the Washington Panthers want to roll with. So the only way you move on from Sam Howell just to draft Drake may to me is that you're that super hung up on height, which again, Cliff Kingsbury drafted Kyler Murray. Um, and again, you know what I mean? Like I know there were some issues there, but I don't think, personality issues with Kyler Murray, dedication issues, study issues with Kyler Murray is going to make Cliff Kingsbury just say, man, all those, all those sub six foot quarterbacks or all those sub six foot two quarterbacks, they just don't study well. Like I don't think Cliff Kingsbury is going to go that far with it. So again, I don't think the height is an issue. So it either means that the height was an issue because that's really the biggest discriminator between Sam Howell and Drake May, or you just think the last coaching staff combination of Ron Rivera, Scott Turner and Eric Bieniemy basically set Sam Howell back so far in bad habits that you can't fix them. And to me, talking to Dan Quinn, it doesn't sound like the approach Dan Quinn would take is, man, you're so damaged that we just can't bring you back, so we're just going to get rid of you. I could be wrong, you're right? And and certainly publicly, that's not the that's not the kind of thing that Dan Quinn is saying, not that you would really expect him to any well. Anyway, but to me, again, it just means to me that Sam Howell doesn't necessarily fit the projection of the style of, of play they want from their offense. And if he doesn't, then Drake may not to the fullest extent, but Drake may certainly to a certain extent doesn't fit the profile either. While Jane Daniels does. We covered that in the first segment here on today's episode. So to me, you either traded Sam because you just don't believe you can repair him or you're going a different direction stylistically, which is Jaden Daniels. So again, this all rolls back to, I'm pretty confident that this team is going Jane Daniels. Now, that being said, this is the first offseason I've dealt with this team, so I'm just getting to know their tendencies, their words, how they match their actions, all that stuff. So certainly could be wrong, certainly willing to admit that. Uh, last year, I was confident that if Christian Gonzalez was on the board when the commanders picked, they would take him. And uh, they went cornerback. They just didn't go Christian Gonzalez. Uh, unfortunately for everybody involved, that did not go well, obviously. So hopefully, if I'm wrong here and they don't go Jane Daniels for all the reasons they just laid out, uh, we're wrong or we, they're right. 
and go in the direction they do go. And we can talk about some winning football in 2024. Uh, and beyond but we will see we're also gonna do our due diligence don't worry we're not just gonna talk about Jane Daniels all the way to the NFL draft we will go in depth on Drake we will go in depth on JJ McCarthy probably go in depth on Michael Penix and we probably might even go in depth on Caleb Williams just to kind of get all that information because you never know Chicago Bears could shock everybody but for right now we're gonna turn the page on the quarterback conversation because we had a question about the defensive back group that I definitely want to address on today's episode of Locked On Commanders part of the Locked On Podcast Network your team every day This mailbag episode of Locked On Commanders here with two questions really kind of combined into one answer coming from Billy and coming from Robert, two of our insiders. Billy asks if you, parentheses, Adam Peters slash Dan Quinn, had the opportunity to draft Minnesota safety Tyler Newbin, would you, would they do it given all they've said about their style of play, like hard hitting, uh, like Jaden Hicks, for example, another reference there. Uh, I've heard you, he's talking about me now take him a number of times, take Tyler Newman a number of times in your mock drafts. But you've also said, ideally, we should be normally taking, looking to take three defensive backs. I typically draft two safeties and a press man corner. I like that. But for the safeties, I've always understood that to mean one free safety as a ball hawk, one strong safety for the box. Does Quan Martin theoretically fill the role that Tyler Newman would roll? And if so, would you draft him anyway if he fell to you, if your assumption is that he's better? Thanks. Thank you as well. Robert kind of said something similar. He asked, what do you think about inserting Quan Martin into the starting free safety slot? I know you have mentioned this. I think he could excel at the position. So good questions. Pretty much similar ballpark. One goes a little bit deeper into draft commentary. And for me, I think when you look at the commander's secondary, I'm fairly confident Jeremy Chin is your starting strong safety, at least to start off, right? He's a box patrol guy. He's kind of a linebacker safety hybrid. So I think he's your starting strong safety. Quan Martin is likely your top free safety right now with Derek Forrest being kind of a do both guy. He can play in the box. He can play coverage. We've seen him do both. It's certainly on tape. So the staff has certainly seen it on the tape. The problem is what does he look like coming back from the injury, right? Before you know that information. And I don't know that information right now. It's hard for me to slot him as a starter anywhere on this defense just because I don't know what he looks like physically. Now the team has the medicals, so they know that information more. So if he looks good, let's go, let's go upside here. If Derek Forrest looks good in his injury recovery and you're confident that he can be your free safety, Jeremy Chin is your strong safety. And to me, that makes Quan your slot defender, your nickel corner. And then really safety nickel corner are not your day one or day two priorities outside corner potentially certainly could be a priority, but if you draft on what you know, then you have Chin as your strong safety. Quan is either your free safety or nickel. And Derek Forrest is a question mark. You don't know anything about him right now because of the injury, because of the new style and scheme that they're going to be installing. So because of that and because of whether it's health or misdevelopment or, or whatever it is. Um, and again, go back to the last question, right? If this team traded Sam Howell because they don't believe they can repair the damage done by the previous coaching staff. Well, Derek Forrest has been working on that previous coaching staff longer. Certainly didn't work under Eric bien but you could argue that the defensive situation actually went a little bit worse. Now, if if you're going to do it that way, right, if you're going to say Derek Forrest is, is a lot of potential, but he's a question mark, Jeremy Chin is our strong safety, and Quan Martin could either be our free safety or a nickel, then to me, you have to take the best free safety or nickel when the chance comes, you know, realistically. Now, Tyler Newman is a physical enough safety that he can make tackles in the box, but I think he's best when he's patrolling the field looking for those interceptions. So he would be, to answer your question, where you're more traditional free safety type, but more of a today's free safety where he can do a little bit of both. Uh, you know, back in like the 90s, early 2000s, you did, you had those free safeties who were basically just cover guys, didn't really do a lot in the box. And you had your strong safeties who were box patrollers, especially over the middle of the field, but didn't really do a lot of deep coverage. These days, you want more like your Derek Forrest and your Cam Curls who can do a little bit of both those things, right? So Tyler Newman, probably your best safety that you can get at number 40. When you look at the athletics, Nick Baumgartner, his last mock draft had uh, Newman going number 47 to the New York Giants. So certainly could be available around that number 40 range. And he does a little bit of both, but could pencil in directly as you're starting free safety. You put Quan Martin uh, in the nickel. Now, Mike Sainer still out of Michigan is the best nickel corner in this class, in my opinion, best true nickel in this class, in my opinion. And he went again in Baumgartner's mock draft for the athletic number 55 to Miami. So in a vacuum, the question is, who do you like more, right? Do you think Tyler Newman is the better safety or, or Mike Sainer still is the better nickel, right? You have to look at him side by side and say, we like this guy more in his position than we like the other guy. That question determines what you do at number 40 in this conversation. If you view the group 
as an early pick target, which again, you do if you don't feel like you have it solidified, then I take Newman. I take Minnesota safety Tyler Newman because he gives you the most bites at the apple. And I look at it this way. You have Quan Martin, who could be your free safety or your nickel corner. You have Derek Forrest, who could be your free safety or your strong safety. You have Jeremy Chin, who could be your strong safety. And now you have Tyler Newbin, who could be your free safety, your strong safety, or your nickel corner in a pinch, right? I don't think Tyler Newman's like, his future is not in the nickel in the slot. But if you needed him, he could fall down in the slot and maybe hold his own. But you can only use Mike Sanders on nickel. I don't see a free safety future in him. Certainly don't see a strong safety future in him. Certainly don't see a perimeter cornerback situation for him. So Mike Sanders still, he's your nickel, and that is it. So if he doesn't work as a nickel, he just doesn't work. So if you spend a second-round pick on Mike Sanders still out of Michigan, you're drafting him to be your nickel, which means Quan Martin is now your free safety, or at minimum, Quan Martin and Derek Forrest are going to battle out for the free safety position i.e. the second safety position, and then Jeremy Chin, like I said, is your strong safety. And really, you would have been a situation where it's like, hey, man, we need a heavy box here. So Derek and Jeremy, and hey, we've got a little bit more of a passing threat, so Quan and Jeremy are in, right? So you have a little bit of a rotational piece there. Um, but again, you take Newbin because he gives you the most versatility in those packages. I mean, let's say you need to go super coverage, so you put Newbin at free safety, you put Quan Martin uh, in, in the slot. Let's say you want to go run heavy. You put Derek Forrest, you put uh, Newman in the slot, and you put Jeremy Chin back there. Now you've got three more tackle-focused guys. Uh, so, again, but Mike Sainer still, he's only good for one of those spots. So I think that's the reason you go uh, Tyler Newman. Not necessarily because he's better, per se. Like, if you like Sainer still more than you like Newman, certainly you could go for that. But I think he, he gives my secondary group, as is currently constructed, more options. Because, again, just I think as a decision maker, you don't give Derek Forrest. You don't say Derek Forrest is going to be this until you see it actually happening, which, again, the team has the medicals. The team seems them work out all those things. I don't have that. That's the reason I've got to take that stance on. So the commander's draft to me really starts with that second second round pick with those two second round picks. I think obviously quarterback at number two. And then if you don't trade back up into the first round, one of those second round picks has got to be a tackle. And then your other second round pick, that could be a corner. It could be a safety. It could be a linebacker. It could be an edge. It could be another tackle. You know what I mean? So I think really with that second, even if they don't have a second second because they trade up to the first round, well, again, that's where the commander's draft gets really interesting is how they use that second second round pick uh, this this April. So uh, that's where things are going to get interesting here. I like the conversation. Really dig the mailbag questions. Uh, as always, commanders fans, you always bring uh, some fire with your mailbag questions. So I greatly appreciate it. That's going to wrap up today's episode. Come back tomorrow. We'll have more commanders content, more news if it comes out. And we'll have some more conversations. In the meantime, if you have questions or comments, throw them in the YouTube comment section or text me directly by becoming a Locked On Commanders Insider. Go to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Commanders. Don't forget, make sure you check out Locked On Sports today, the first ever 24-7 live streaming sports channel on YouTube. And as always, thanks so much for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day every day. Every day, thanks for coming through on a regular basis like you do. Until we speak again, if you're out about, please be safe, be kind, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.